So uh, we'll go over case number one. Um, so this this is a 56 year old female uh, with a history of uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, and she first presented to me after having an L4 to S1 fusion. Uh, this uh, resulted in adjacent segment disease, and she required an extension to T11. Uh, she subsequently then required an extension to T4. So this is a, a, a classic scenario where uh, the SI joints uh, initially, you know, were not being loaded very much with the L4 to S1 fusion, uh, and then eventually uh, required uh, 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 some kind of intervention because her SI joint pain uh, was was pretty severe. Uh, so so it's 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 quite natural for this patient to have had SI joint pain, you know, she had a long lever arm down to the pelvis. And this is one of those scenarios where it was an addition of fusion step by step, you know, not all at once. And so in retrospect, you know, perhaps pelvic fixation, uh, at, you know, at the, during the first surgery uh, or the second surgery would have, would have, uh, you know, provided some kind of stabilization or a buffer uh, to the SI joints. Um, so, so uh, anyhow, so how the way she presented ultimately was uh, as a patient with a T4 to S1 fusion and and a pretty significant uh, SI joint pain, as as is not surprising. So. Because this patient had uh, SI joint pain, uh, she was thought to be a suitable candidate for uh, uh, these iliosacral screws. And the iliosacral screws uh, provided some stabilization, uh, but Unfortunately, despite the initial benefits of the initial placement of these iliosacral screws, uh, she uh, developed uh, a persistent uh, pain. And uh, you can appreciate uh, a little bit of, of, uh, of a space with the air. I'm not sure if, if my arrow is visible, but uh, it, hopefully it is. Um, and uh, you can appreciate a little bit of a halo around, around these screws, indicative of uh, persistent motion, uh, and there's no bridging of bone adjacent to the screws, uh, furthermore indicating uh, that uh, this was a non-union. So this, this CT scan was uh, well over two to three years after these screws were placed. And this was all done in stages. You know, this, this, these, these screws over here on the right uh, were placed. The, the initial uh, screw was this uh, extension of the construct with a pelvic screw uh, as a means to uh, serve as a stabilizing entity on the right side because she had right greater than left SI joint pain, and then she developed left-sided SI joint pain and uh, required. Uh, two screws that were placed, uh, and she's developed persistent pain, so I added another screw, uh, and the story goes on. So, you know, she required multiple additional fixations, and ultimately this culminated in a non-union. So what do you do with this situation? The real estate is consumed, you, you know, and, and it, it makes it more of a challenging case. Charlie, were so, there any biologics in those, or are those just transfixing screws? So, so there, there. That's a good question. Uh, there, there were biologics. Uh, uh, the, we used uh, some uh, Vivigen, uh, which was a uh, cellular allograft um, in this in the lumen of those screws. Uh, did not use uh, off-label BMP. Um, so, uh, given the difficulty associated with the the fact that uh, the, the hardware was occupying a lot of the real estate where one would normally put in uh, salvage uh, fixation. 
uh, and given the need to decorticate the joints, uh, we felt this was an ideal uh, uh, case uh, for the robot. Um, so, so depicted in this slide here uh, are two trajectories uh, that that the the robot uh, would was able to uh, we were able to create to guide the drill uh, of the robot uh, into the SI joints themselves to help uh, facilitate the decortication of those joints. However, uh, prior to being able to, to do that, it would require uh, removal of, of uh, the iliosacral screws. Um, and so, uh, you know, you're, we're not able to decorticate the joint without removal of, of some of the hardware because the hardware essentially is in, it would be in the way. So the robot was uh, quite useful in creating the trajectories to get to the screws. Uh, and that would be step one, basically removing the iliosacral screws. And then step two would be uh, drilling uh, uh, into the SI joint itself to decorticate the joint. Uh, and then step three would be placement of uh, further fixation in the form of uh, S2AI fixation or iliac fixation, depending upon uh, your, your, uh, your preference. Um, this is the setup. Uh, uh, this this uh, is a setup after um, the iliosacral screws had been removed, and uh, the the robot uh, was utilized to drill a, uh, a guide wire to drill a, a trajectory into the SI joints, uh, and a guide wire was placed uh, uh, into the SI joint in the trajectory drilled by by the robot and. Uh, this this T-handled instrument is actually a reamer, uh, and that reamer was used to uh, 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 create a, a decorticated path within the SI joint. Uh, depicted here uh, is the actual uh, insertion of this bone funnel uh, into the SI joint, uh, and uh, it happens that the bone funnel uh, is about uh, nine millimeters in diameter. And, uh, and that, that we, we drill a, a hole that is in uh, of equivalent diameter to the outside diameter of the bone funnel and essentially pack uh, that, that, or essentially place the, uh, the bone funnel all the way down about 40 millimeters to, to the very uh, anterior aspect of the SI joint. And then we pack that funnel full of, of allograft. And then slowly we inch away uh, or millimeter by millimeter, you pull out the funnel and then pack more bone into the joint. And so this gives you a very good uh, ability to, to pack the SI joint with bone. Uh, and then once you've packed both sides of the SI joints, this is just a close-up of, of uh, packing, packing the SI joint with a funnel. You can appreciate this is a, a relatively good uh, funnel, about uh, nine millimeters in diameter, uh, and uh, it's an opportunity to really get a good arthrodesis. So uh, uh, the strategy used here was removal of the iliosacral screws uh, and placement of uh, uh, S2AI screws and, and having uh, 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 bilaterally uh, two S2AI screws placed uh, to further uh, stabilize the pelvis and, and uh, get the whole thing hooked up uh, to the original construct. So six, six months later, this is a CT scan um, and and uh, I use the arrows uh, to uh, demonstrate uh, evidence of uh, osseous union. Uh, you can see some bridging bone, and this is about six months, maybe a little less than six months after uh, the uh, uh, the surgery. You can appreciate that there is bridging bone, 
uh, you can see that there's a bridging bone here to here, here to here, uh, more bridging bone. Um, you can appreciate, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, there's bridging bone cross over here. Um, you may uh, also appreciate that one of the ileocecal screws was not removed. Uh, we were able to work around uh, that particular iliosacral screw and decided not to remove it because it had evidence of bone growth that spanned uh, the, the uh, center of the screw. And furthermore, the outside of the screw was not really uh, easily reachable. Um, it, there was bone that had grown over it and through it, uh, and uh, it would have been a challenging screw uh, to remove because it would require uh, the engagement of of the uh, of the uh, star shaped uh, insertion of the screwdriver, uh, which was all filled with bone. Um, so we were able to work around that. And you can appreciate this is how, how uh, she looks uh, with the bilateral iliac screws. Um, uh, this is one of my earliest cases of SI joint fusion that had, uh, and, and, you know, now that uh, I've, you know, had some experiences with SI joint fusion failures, uh, I think it's important to decorticate the joint uh, in this capacity before instrumenting the joint. Um, you know, most MIS SI joint fusions don't really have uh, a thorough decortication step. And I think this uh, potential technique may be, may be useful. So um, I'll, I'll discuss another uh, SI joint uh, uh, case. Um, this is a 46 year old female with uh, a previously uh, MI instrumented uh, MIS SI joint fusion. Uh, she had partial benefit from this fusion her main issue was uh, uh, severe pain when laying down, uh, you know, on the left side. And one of the problems that sometimes uh, 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 patients face uh, is prominence of the implants. You know, as, as you can see, uh, this patient had persistent pain uh, after surgery and uh, you can appreciate, uh, th and th this patient was referred to me from, from a, a pain management doctor in, in uh, actually close to Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, and she, she, uh, she was just really not able to sit because uh, it was just very, uh, very painful to have these, these prominent uh, implants there. Um, so, uh, uh, Again, this is the type of situation where where the real estate is pretty much utilized, and and uh, uh, it, it's it's difficult to to uh, do any additional fixation with these these uh, implants in the way. So uh, it, not all of them needed to be removed, but but uh, two out of the out of the uh, four implants uh, were, were removed in order to make room. Uh, for further pelvic fixation. Um, and uh, you can see that after uh, performing the, the uh, uh, pelvic fixation, um, we're able to appreciate uh, some osseous union uh, and a, a uh, uh, solid arthrodesis. Um, so uh, it's just a, a little uh, a uh, reminder that the uh, spine section uh, meets in uh, Miami in, in March uh, of 2023. Um, it's at the Fontainebleau Resort. So uh, please, please join us. Um, so I so, uh, just wanted to, to, to touch, uh, touch base about these, these uh, failed SI joint fusions. Um, I personally feel that we're gonna see quite a few of these over the next few years um, because the MIS SI joint fusion strategies, um, uh, often they do, they do succeed, but, but uh, for those cases where the patient gets better initially and then does not get better 
or, or, or has return of symptoms, uh, I, I think there needs to be a high index of suspicion that there is a failed uh, fusion and, and we need to come up with ways uh, to, to solve these problems. And sometimes they're, they're, it's not easy. So uh, Charlie, how, are you, how are you diagnosing these? Are you doing SI injections on these patients and looking for a significant pain relief? Yeah. So that's, that's the, the, so, the, so, the first first step is is diagnosis through through injection, but most importantly, the the, the prior to that, the first step is uh, an appropriate physical examination, uh, where you have a, a, a positive favor test, positive uh, Patrick sign, a positive Fortin finger test, a positive thigh thrust test. Uh, all of these are are. Uh, uh, the tricky thing about the SI joint is, and the reason why it's so controversial, uh, is that it's not easy to make the diagnosis. Um, even the SI joint injections are hard to make the diagnosis because very often the relief is just so temporary. You know, a, a positive uh, response to an SI joint injection uh, may simply last as little as, as 24 hours. You know, and, and so you, when you get the patients, uh, you know, to get the injections, you have to tell them that they've got to pay attention uh, for the first 24 to 48 hours and see what their pain scores went down to. And sometimes it's hard to tell because the injection itself may cause pain. Um, and then you may get a false negative interpretation of that test. Um, <clears throat> I think those so, are great points. Uh, do you think the both the physical testing and the, um, the response to the injection is different in patients who have failed uh, implants in than patients who are virgins in their SI joint? In other words, is there enough fixation even with pseudoarthroses um, to kind of block your, your diagnostic ability? Yeah, so I, I think that once, if, I think that if for a patient, if you're receiving a patient with a failed SI joint fusion or a pseudoarthrosis, it's, it, I think it's important to look at the previous diagnostic criteria that were utilized prior to their instrumented uh, uh, SI joint fusion. Um, you, you know, sometimes these patients are referred to me, sometimes they're patients that I myself create. Uh, and so I obviously have a better uh, understanding and faith in the diagnosis when it's a patient that I myself have started out with. Um, but for a patient that's referred to me, uh, it, it's very important to go back to the, to the, to the be very beginning prior to uh, their surgery and to really uh, pin down what was done and how the diagnosis was made and how the response was to the injections and what kind of physical exam maneuvers were positive. Um, and uh, it's it's a it's a it's a challenge sometimes because sometimes those records are not available. Sometimes the patient's a bad historian. Um, sometimes the patient's in so much pain uh, that you can just barely touch them, and and uh, and it, and the pseudoarthrosis combined with the SI joint pain history uh, can be can be uh, you know, make them overt, very very substantially symptomatic. And sometimes it's hard to, because you, you know, all of those exam, physical exam findings will be positive um, because they're so sensitive uh, that it, sometimes it's, it's hard to, to, to really get a good picture. And then sometimes uh, the hardware is in the way of, uh, or, or there are osteophytes that are in the way, uh, and that makes the other treatment modalities difficult to perform you know, where the, I've had pain management doctors say that they couldn't get the needle where they wanted it to go uh, to help treat some of these pseudoarthrosis patients. I've also had pain, pain management doctors. Uh, we've, a try, we've attempted to do uh, SI joint rhizotomies on these patients. Uh, and, uh, the, and, and the pain management doctors say that sometimes there's scar tissue and uh, uh, osteophytes that develop uh, in areas where that it makes it 
difficult to access the anatomy where they would normally do the SI joint rhizotomy. So it presents like a, a, a clinical challenge. Yeah, I mean, I like your concept, you know, making use of the fact that it's a very broad articular surface. And if your failure is, is perpendicular to the joint, I like your idea of getting the hardware that you need to out of the way and then trying to come in um, parallel to the joint and, and do a formal fusion, which is, I think, the appropriate uh, concept. So, um, you know, those are really nice case examples. Thank and you, you find the robot is really helpful. Do you, are you navigating um, stuff in uh, with the robot as well? Um, so, so yeah, the, I find the robot to be helpful. I mean, if the, the robot is primarily helpful, uh, in my opinion, to work around the existing hardware. Um, the, the case that I presented earlier over here, uh, you could see that she had this a uh, right-sided iliac screw that was good. There was nothing wrong with it other than maybe it needed to be upsized a, a little bit. So we preserved that trajectory. Uh, uh, we removed the top iliosacral screw and, and used the robot to create another trajectory above the iliosacral screws. It just makes it a little bit easier to work around hardware. Um, and, uh, and the other thing, thing is that on the on the left side when you remove all of those screws um, there's an absence of bone so the normal tactile feedback that you get when you use the iliac probe is somewhat diminished because uh, there are more cortical surfaces that you need to pass through other than simply the SI joint um, because you may be passing through the cortical surface uh, of one of the trajectories of the screws and so it kind of makes it confusing um, sometimes, and you, there may be a sudden deceleration. These screws are about 12 millimeters in diameter, so you may get like a like What's a that? one centimeter de deceleration Perfect. when you're using the iliac. Then you can replace that so, one screw. So the robot uh, helps you all the guide down. you. Thank you, Charlie. Hey, Charlie. This is Rod. Um, Great presentation. I have a Thanks, question buddy. for you. Um, uh, you pro I don't know if you know the answer to this, but where in the hell does the pain come from? <laughs> uh, so uh, that's a very good question. Um, the reason why I think it's a, and it's actually a very uh, uh, strong interest of mine um, one of the studies that we're currently working on is looking at the position of our iliosacral screws and seeing if the pain relief depends upon the location yeah, of where those screws are. Um, so so uh, th there's, there's uh, p some people have written uh, about this, and there's this one uh, textbook actually that's uh, about SI joint pain, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm just trying to remember Dr. Donner, I believe is his name, uh, in, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, I believe, and he wrote like some anecdotal notes about how some patients do very well uh, with uh, certain positions of SI joint screws and some patients do worse. Um, and uh, and there there's, appears to be a sweet spot somewhere that we don't know. And, uh, and I have my theories about where that might be. I think it's close to the S2 ALA. Um, and and uh, that's my theory, uh, but I, I'm trying to prove it. Um, so do and, you think and, part of the Charlie is, do you think, um, that I'm not looking hard enough for the area? Cause I swear, I don't know what it is, but it's one of these things where I just, it's one of these diagnoses that I think if you start looking for it, you can find more patients, you know? Yeah, de definitely. You know, I, I tell you, I started doing SI joint fusions in 2015 and, uh, and uh, there was one particular uh, case uh, that really 
made me a believer. Um, this patient had a collapsed disc space at L5-S1 and was having some low back pain. She had a little bit of lumbar kyphosis uh, and uh, ended up having an ALIF uh, because she also had some foraminal stenosis. Um, so we did an indirect decompression and improved her lumbar lordosis and improved her, her foraminal height. Uh, and her, her pain did not really get better. So I said, oh, well, it was a standalone ALIF. Uh, maybe she's moving a little bit and maybe that there's just not enough rigid fixation. So I, so I did a posterior instrumented fusion L5 to S1 and I opened up the frame and widely to make sure that there was absolutely no chance that that could, uh, you know, uh, still bother her. And uh, her pain got worse. So, so, uh, so I was, it was right, right around that time um, that SI joint fusions were starting to become more and more popular and was reading the, the uh, red journal uh, articles from Dave Polly about the clinical trial results of SI joint fusions. And uh, it was, it was a sort of a topic of, of uh, that, you know, was getting new, relatively popular, but not in incredibly popular. And, and so I, and I thought to myself, gosh, my patient must have this. And uh, next time she came to see me, I, I pushed on her SI joints and did all of those physical exam maneuvers and her SI joints were, uh, bewilderingly positive in terms of pain and symptoms. And so we did an SI joint fusion on her and uh, she was cured on, on one side, 100% cured. Um, so the other side, she was having, you know, pain and it was getting worse. And I, I did an SI joint fusion on the other side, same exact way as the other side. That side never got better. So, so it's a, it's a clinical dilemma for me as to why that side did not get better because I did the same thing on the right than I did on the left. And, uh, and that's why I have this hypothesis that there's a sweet spot somewhere that we don't know about. And on the right side, I got through the S2 ALA, the, the part of that S2 ALA, like that bump within the SI joint, um, that you can see that's, which is essentially the vestigial S2 transverse process. Sorry, I said S2 ALA. I meant to say S2 transverse process. You know, there, there are transverse processes of the sacrum, that, that, but they're sort of incorporated into the, the, the they're, they're very, you know, they're, they're not obvious transverse processes, but they're, but they're sort of connected to the, the ALA. Uh, and there, there's like a bump that you normally see uh, within the SI joints, I, my hypothesis uh, is that that bump, uh, which is the S2 transverse process, is is uh, is is I think the sensitive spot where where the decortication needs to occur. And Charlie, one more question. I mean, aren't we doing, I mean, especially nowadays, I saw those beautiful reconstructions um, that you did. Aren't we fusing the SI joint? Because most of us are doing S2AI or, you know, like they're modified iliac screws. Um, aren't we fusing the SI joint? So, so I'm sorry, Rob. What did you say? So, so and when, when you, you do so, so when we do these long constructs like the ones that you showed, um, you know, where it fused on that one side and it didn't fuse on the other side, aren't we? I mean, a lot of times we get bone growing across that side joint after you know lumbosacral reconstruction. Well, well, sometimes um, you, you know you do get spontaneous growth of bone uh, just simply due to the exposure. Uh, you know, uh, when we take off the ligaments uh, in order to expose our, so part of the problem of pelvic fixation is that you're bovying through the same ligaments that support the SI joint. This is especially true when you expose the PSIS and you take your chisel 
and take off a big chunk of bone from the PSIS in order to make the iliac tulipad recess. When you do that, you're exposing the PSIS and you're often bovying through a lot of those ligaments that support the SI joint and hence creating uh, some degree of ligamentous instability. Um, furthermore, when you expose the S2 entry point, uh, even if you don't expose the PSIS and you expose the S2AI entry point, you still use the bovi and bovi through some of the ligaments in that area. So I feel like you create a little bit of instability related to the approach to the uh, uh, S2AI screw or the pelvic screws. So you're starting out with a joint that's gonna be loaded from the long segment construct. And then you destabilize the joint a little bit by bobing around that area. And then you put in your screw uh, to help support the S1 screws, which it does because pelvic screws are well known to help with the uh, arthrodesis of L5S1. Um, but the problem is, uh, if you're not actively decorticating the cartilage of the SI joint, uh, it's relatively unlikely that it's going to fuse unless the patient has a natural tendency to, to fuse, uh, which sometimes happens spontaneously in a lot of patients. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, so I, I guess, Tim, uh, do you want to go go over some of the, the, the papers that, that sure. you... Uh... Sure. Let me share screen. Okay. Yeah, and so, yeah, so thanks, Dr. Santor. I, I, um, I remember both of your two cases you you presented here and um, remember them very well, but I don't think until, until just now I'd seen the, uh, the follow-up CT scan. So, so that I just want to say that was a really great result. Yeah. Thanks. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I just, you know, Nathan and I were just going to help out a little bit here, just looking back into the literature and what's been written about revision of SI joint uh, fusion uh, and to be honest, there's, there's very little, um, but, but some of what we find here, these are just two articles. You, you can see they're both funded by Cybone. Hey, Tim, and, do you want to go into the presentation mode? Yeah, let me. Just so we can see the full slide. It's just that. Just a slideshow. Yeah, just the slideshow view. There's a little. Sure. Button on the bottom next to where you can, there you go. Sure, sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, so, so these are just, these are two studies and, and the first is just, is, is uh, really looking and just comparing the, the uh, four year revision rate for the traditional threaded screw, uh, which they were just calling here as, as referring to as fixation versus the triangular titanium implant showing a, a much lower rate. And, and, you know, when these came out, these are, are specifically you know, designed to, to have more bone in growth and on growth. Um, the second is, is another uh, study, a cadaveric study, basically coming to the conclusion that, you know, they simulated for both early and late revision um, by, by, by upsizing uh, screws. And in the latter case, uh, that they'll delay by chiseling out quite a bit of bone and basically showed that, you know, there's from a biomechanical standpoint, there, there is hope that you know, it, it, these, these revision screws can, can certainly um, uh, limit uh, motion of the SI joint in several directions. Um, but, but more to what we're, we're really talking about here as far as a, a technique, um, you know, there is another paper uh, out of a group in, in Nevada. And I, I think a, a lot of their, their main points are what Dr. Sansor and our, our group is, is trying to get at. Uh, they look back at four patients who, who in this case actually had failure of the triangular titanium implants uh, with pain and evidence of lucency. And they, they describe their technique for revision um, 
was number one to, to really focus on on decortication. Um, they're not coming in from so much laterally a, a, as in they're coming more ventral to dorsal. And presumably what they mean by decortication here is, is really spending some time with the reamer when that's right over the joint itself, uh, dedicating uh, um, uh, an effort toward decortication there. And you, you can see that bottom figure is what they're, they're going for by altering their trajectory more ventral to dorsal and more caudal to cranially is really trying to get these new revised implants through, through the synovium of, of the SI joint itself. And, and you can see the, the revision there, those triangular uh, implants, uh, much of the area of them is, is, is spanning what, what we would call the, uh, the uh, interosseous region between the sacrum and the ilium. Um, so this is you know, some of, of what's been written about technique. I, I think what what our group, what Dr. Santor has shown is, is a little bit different and it, it really benefits from a more direct uh, decortication through the entire length of the joint itself from, from a dorsal uh, approach using the robot. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it, interesting to, you know, biomechanically, you know, look at the difference between the geometry of the implants. And, uh, you know, I, I need to look into this uh, further and see if there's like a biomechanical study that compares the two. I presume that there would be. All right, I will uh, begin to share my slide here. All right, so uh, my name is Nathan Han. I'm with a PGY5 residents uh, here at University of Maryland. I'm gonna present two papers. Uh, one is a retrospective case study, and another one is a cadaveric study. And this first study here by Cognetti and the orthopedic group at Houston, Texas, um, they wrote an article on minimally invasive SI um, fusion revision, a technique guide, looking at five uh, patients that required a revision from 2015 to 2018 of their SI fusion. Uh, the goal of their paper, they mentioned, was to highlight the key technical pros and consideration that goes in when you're considering an SI joint fusion revision. And as Dr. Sanser mentioned, um, some elements that you want to consider in patients who had SI uh, joint fusion and um, for them to suspect to have failure is number one, um, they may have a foraminal violation um, of the instrumentation itself, either through the, the sacral foramen or um, penetrating through the ala, causing radiculopathy. And second reasoning is, again, uh, pseudoarthrosis with hardware loosening. And in this paper, they mentioned they noticed more of the pseudoarthrosis occurring in the sacral component of this hardware and typically occurs in a time period of six months to a year after um, their SI, initial SI joint fusion. And thirdly, a little bit less obvious is that uh, in patients that they noticed with implant that were went through the ligamentous joint span, which is more in the dorsal aspect of the joint, they noticed that um, there is less um, uh, chance of union in those patients. Uh, and they hypothesize that it's likely due to the increased intraarticular distance at the dorsal two-thirds of the joint, and that decreases the rate of bony bridging. Somewhat similar to how what Dr. Sanser was mentioning, and is there a you know, good location that you know may provide better fusion for this SI joint? Uh, this is a diagram that they show um, demonstrating this, the dorsal ligamentous uh, area of the SI joint, the cartilaginous um, portion of the SI joint. And this is the cartilaginous anterior portion that uh, has the decreased or smaller intraarticular distance that may provide better bony fusion. So in their intraoperative steps, um, they make a, an incision over the prior implant area. They place a tubular retractor over that implant, take out the screw if necessary. And in their case, in this empty space where the prior screw came out, they will pack it with bone graft or BMP in that empty tract. 
and using stereotactic guidance, they would uh, alter the trajectory of the new screw more in the anterior or ventral um, uh, uh, direction. And with their three screws that they put, you know, they put the cephalad one near to the ventral of the S1 frame and the middle screw uh, right um, at the S1 frame and prior to breaching and the caudal screw between the S1 and S2 foramen. And they also use the triangular titanium screws in their cases. Uh, this is their fluoroscopy and CT scan of their results demonstrating the, the triangular uh, new, newly replaced screws on the, on the left side and showing that in the lateral view of that fluoroscopy, um, they really try to aim at the anterior or ventral um, area of the joint. And the last um, slide here is a two-year follow-up scan demonstrating an interosseous bone bridging uh, occurring across the, the anterior portion of that SI uh, joint screw. Um, their post-operative outcome, they state that all their patients completely had uh, improvement of their SI joint pain and radiculopathy after the revision, although they did have some um, com uh, complications with trochanter bursitis and uh, low back pain, which one patient ultimately re required a, a T10 to pelvis fusion. So their take-home points was that in patients with recurrent pain or worsening radiculopathy after their initial SI joint fusion, uh, we should warrant additional concern for potential pseudoarthrosis or implant malposition of the iliosacral screws. And that the second point is implants in the ventral cartilaginous portion of the SI joint may have more fusion success uh, with that decreased intraarticular distance leading to a higher rate of interosseous bridging. And in their case, they recommend that stereotactic navigation you know, greatly aids in the revision placement of the SI joint screws uh, with the new trajectory to really target the specific foraminal cor corridors that may be more beneficial for additional SI joint uh, arthrodesis. The second paper that I want to present was done by uh, one of our alumni here, Dr. Mushlin, and uh, under the guidance of Dr. Sansor. Uh, this was a cadaveric biomechanical study of the effect of long segments of sacral fusion on the SI joint. Um, they also uh, observed the L5-S1 uh, vertebral body mobility and SI joint range of motion under different uh, flexion extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation conditions with six different fusion constructs. And this is the six different types of construct that was, that was used. Um, there's a little bit of lag here. Uh, here you go. So uh, seven ca cadavers, one was without any instrumentation. Um, once the second one had a, just T10 to S1, a pedicle screws with rod fixation. Another one had a unilateral left-sided uh, iliac screw, uh, bilateral iliac screws, and unilateral iliac with um, right-sided um, SI joint fusion. Uh, just the unilateral right-sided SI joint fusion and bilateral SI joint fusion. And with these different um, constructs, they underwent um, a loading and unloading cycles at 10 newton meter max load. And uh, they measured the range of motion uh, in between the vertebral bodies and the SI joint. And this was their data um, demonstrating that uh, in the L5-S1 mobility uh, compared to the non-instrumented, um, there was definitely a reduction of mobility in the L5-S1 in all different, all, all constructs. Um, but more importantly, for in, in terms of our talk here today, the table two and table three demonstrates the SI joint mobility after these fusions. And you can, def you can see that in the posterior spinal fusion only, the T10 to S1, there's definitely a more uh, mobility of this um, SI joint, even compared to the non-instrumented, uh, uh, consistent with the long um, loading construct causing additional stress at that SI joint. And something that is interesting to see is, um, you know, just with the bilateral SI joint fusion itself has almost similar effect of reducing that mobility compared to the uh, bilateral iliac screw fixation. And in addition, a uh, unilateral iliac screw fixation on the left side also has some degree of reduction of mobility on the contralateral non-fuse side, side as well. And this is a, a graph that kind of makes it more easier to, easier to see visually 
where they uh, normalize the mobility levels to the, the posterior uh, spinal fusion only from T10 to S1. And you can see that in flexion extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation, and all the mobility, the, the spinal fusion uh, definitely had the greatest mobility and the bilateral iliac screws and the SI joint, bilateral SI joint fusion were all pretty similar in terms of the mobility reduction. Yeah, so in essence, um, that paper basically says that pelvic fixation and iliosacral fixation uh, provide similar stability of the SI joint biomechanically. And so that was kind of an unknown question at the time. That, that was the reason for that study. Like I had no idea whether an iliosacral screw was equally stable to the same uh, construct with pelvic fixation attached to the rods. Um, so it turns out that pelvic fixation attached to the rods is equally stable to iliosacral uh, fixation. Yes, so Dr. Stan has summarized the key points of that study nicely for me. So I'll oh, end. sorry. <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention about uh, one of the papers that Nathan mentioned uh, is, you know, the cases that I presented uh, are cases where I actually went in and opened up this, the, the posterior aspect of the spine in order to do the SI joint uh, revision arthrodesis. And uh, you could adopt the approach that was uh, demonstrated by those authors from Texas. I forgot the name of the senior author on that or the, the primary author. Uh, but uh, with when you take out one of those implants, you have a nice corridor to place bone grafting material and that can serve as the arthrodesis. And so that's kind of like the take home point, I think from that paper is that if you don't wanna open up the back of the spine and you still wanna sort of restrict uh, this to an MIS strategy, you, it's feasible. Um, you just simply have to remove some of the old implants that didn't work and put some stronger biologics in this corridor where those previous implants were and then place new implants, uh, you know, perhaps in a, in a better spot um, in order to, uh, you know, uh, get a try at, a, a, a new try at, at arthrodesing. You know, my, my only concern is that you, you are only able to really arthrodese the area where the implants were removed. So I, I think it would probably require removal of two implants. Uh, so so that's, that's one potential strategy. Another strategy that I've used is to use the robot. What I do is I remove the implants, I back them out, and these are assuming that they're screw implants. You know, the triangular implants, you can't just back them out. Those are harder to remove. Um, but if they're screw implants and they still have some reasonable fixation, but there's just absence of bony healing, um, what I do is I back them out, take the robot, decorticate with the robot percutaneously, you know, MIS, and then screw the implants back in. You, you, you know, and, and then that way you get the opportunity to do arthrodesis. Uh, you know, through the robot and you get like the corridor that you need uh, with a robot to, to decorticate that SI joint. And I usually, I've been, I've been doing it in more than one trajectory, the arthrodesis step. I, I try to do it in, in maybe two vectors or maybe three. Uh, and that, that gives you an extra opportunity to add more bone um, through one incision. You can actually arthrodesis that joint you can get the robot to use the same entry point, tilt it down and then tilt it up and then make it go, you know, you can use the same incision and get three corridors of, of bone grafting opportunities. And then uh, the same screws that you backed out, you just screw them back in and then you're done.
Really, any yeah. thought to just uh, packing, you know, decorticating and then packing that track with bone using your funnel and then putting the implant back in um, once you have it full of bone, you know, that. It, yes. That's, so that's exactly what I was trying to describe, you know, so like you, the screws that are partially loosened, but not substantially loosened. If it's just like a lack of bone union, you can unscrew them partially, let the SI joint be accessible with the robotic decortication. You decorticate that, and then you screw the screws back in. Looks like one of the questions was, is there data to support taking out the screws and putting in bigger screws, or should another trajectory be used? You know, in that last scenario that I just described, um, I think if you feel like the fixation is not good and and uh, uh, and you're able to have the opportunity to decorticate the SI joint, um, then then you can upsize the screws. Uh, but there are certain companies that may not have screws that are larger than 12 millimeters. You know, some of the implants are 12 millimeters, and I don't know if they have like a uh, a salvage screw that's like 14 millimeters in size. Um, you know, the, 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 the screws that were utilized in the first case uh, are made by Medtronic. It was called Rialto, and th those are 12 millimeters wide. I don't know if they, I don't think they have like a 14 millimeter wide salvage screw, but Charlie, may I speak? Yes. Hey, Jens. Uh, so uh, thank you for taking this uh, difficult subject on your, your biomechanics work and clinical work is, as always, great and much needed. For me, the ultimate uh, beginning of the problem lies with our diagnostic uh, uncertainty. Uh, we all have had multiple sessions, and you've uh, led one at the Spine Summit, which I find is one of the best meetings ever. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as to how difficult a time we have in uh, clinically ascertaining SI joint pain, the infiltrations uh, that we use that are the gold standard to come up with an SI joint diagnosis are still very problematic because they're frequently not done with the CT scan. Uh, they frequently bathe the lumbodorsal fascia with uh, lidocaine and stimulate a pain relief, which may be entirely false because it's actually a myofascial pain. So I think we really still struggle with overdiagnosis, uh, too sensitive, non-specific uh, testing regimen. And we place way too much uh, of a hope, which is largely industry driven, um, with titanium spacers that have no real bone ingrowth or bridging capability. They are really just, I call it metal illusions. And so this is uh, from beginning to uh, execution frequently a problem. And, uh, you doing a yeoman's work with your group of trying to find salvage techniques is something that if we had a better handle on utilization would probably not be as big of a problem. Um, in terms of the, the fusion technique, again, I want to go back to the old orthopedic principles of getting the lumbopelvic junction to fuse. Uh, I think Robert Klein, who was on there, texted about why did we not have this problem when we had galvus confusions? Well, we actually turned down a triangle with a posterior crest into that junction of the lateral uh, L4 or 5 transverse process in the sacral ala, probably decorticated a little bit, folded that down. So we bridged to the ilium. Jack Ziegler, who trained at Rancho, will remember that also. So this was a very nice technique in which you get a very solid fusion. And again, we didn't even bother with the SI joints. We just turned down the ilia crest and it literally nests in there very nicely. And you can even leave it with a muscle attachment to heal them. So so there are many ways. Bob McGuire has a wonderful technique where he reams out the SI joint from your posterior exposure with uh, Midas and then puts uh, fibula allograft in there. That's something that I still use. So you have a direct fusion of the joint. So I just want to point out, uh, we are really kind of misled by industry a little bit and in, in trusting too much in these SI joint fusions that are really not fusions that may or may not be indicated. And I'm not talking about the long constructs, which clearly need pelvic fusions. I'll shut up. Thank you for letting me talk. Absolutely. Thanks, Jens. Yeah, that, I think those are very insightful comments. And, you know, there's, uh, 
definitely a school of surgeons that are in the world of deformity that that will uh, place their pelvic screws um, close to the sciatic notch and then take the opportunity to place an additional SI joint fusion uh, you know, technique uh, above the pelvic screw. Um, and uh, I think some preliminary data suggests that those patients have uh, better uh, outcomes than those who do not uh, have a simultaneous fusion. But there's always bias because some of those patients may have pre-existing SI joint dysfunction. And it's tricky because you got to know, I think what the, the biggest benefit of all of this uh, emphasis on SI joints within the past, you know, couple years is that it makes us better doctors because we check and examine our patients more thoroughly when they have lumbosacral problems. And it makes us more uh, cognizant of, uh, you know, the, its presence and, and uh, makes us more sensitive to the complaints of the patient. So, so if you do have a patient with exquisite SI joint pain who needs a T10 to pelvis, maybe it would be reasonable to fuse that joint at the same time. Um, um, so so it's, it's, uh, these patients are often multifactorial um, and, uh, and, and uh, it's, um, it's, they, they can be challenging scenarios. Yeah, Charlie, I think, you know, it's a very timely topic because as you and Jens have both kind of alluded to the, the, um, uh, this is the problem that, that we're going to see more of, I think, in the future, um, yeah. as, as the diagnosis is still somewhat elusive, there may be some potential for overuse. Um, and there are, uh, there's a rush to, to be use the, uh, the, the sexiest, most minimal approach, which may not always be the best way to get an arthrodesis in a joint that's, that can be difficult to fuse even under the best uh, of, of the circumstances. So yeah. um, I think we'll be revisiting this topic uh, uh, yet again in the future, but yeah, you know, I, I agree. You know. So thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and your crew, you did a great job for us and uh, we appreciate it very much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the invitation. Excellent. All right, everybody stay well. We'll see Great you in a couple job, of weeks. Great job, Charlie. Thanks, Great. buddy. Thanks. Marilyn, thank you, Dr. Ziegler. Thank you, Dr. Sanser. Good night, good night, everyone. Okay, good night. Thank you.